Good morning. I'm Pastor Stephen Kays of the Memphis Valley Southern Family's Church. Glad you're with us today. It's July 4. I hope you and your family have a, a wonderful Sabbath on this July 4th day. If you'd like more information about our church, you can go to the RaleighSDA.org website. There we have archived sermons. We have information about our ministries. So we're glad that you, you can be here with us. And our sermon title is Abraham's Wells and the Old Paths. Let's have a word of prayer together. Father in heaven, we love you. We're grateful we can come and dig into these great stories of the Old Testament. Send your Holy Spirit to guide us. Speak through me to your children that we can all be learning together. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 26 quite a bit. I'll be also going to other verses in the Bible, but in Genesis 26, if you want to get your Bible and follow along. And we are in verses 12 through 15, and we'll pick up the story here. It's actually a story how Isaac has the land. So I'll read here. Then Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. He had a bountiful harvest. And the Lord blessed him. The man began to prosper and continued prospering until he became very prosperous. He had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and great numbers of servants. And the Philistines, Philistines envied him. They were jealous. Now the Philistines had stopped up their wells, which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father. So way back before Isaac got into land, what did the Philistines do when Abraham died? They stopped up those wells, it says here, and they filled them with earth. Does it make sense? Does it? Free water. They didn't have to work for them. They were out there with their herds. So having access to the wells meant something. It meant support. It meant life. Abraham went through considerable trouble. He and his service, they dig those wells. They had to dig them by hand. It doesn't make sense that the people they would plug up those wells. What they do? They actually kept themselves off from a source of life. They needed water out there for their livestock. And they didn't want anything to do with the waters that Abraham had provided from his wells. And I'm going to make a spiritual application here. What waters are we talking about in Isaiah chapter 12, verses 1 through 3? And in that day you will say, O oh Lord, I will praise you. Though you were angry with me, your anger has turned away, and you comforted me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust not be afraid, for Yah, the Lord, is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Therefore, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. The gospel promises came through Abraham. God was to bless the whole world through him. His descendants would be like the stars of, of heaven. And so the wells that Abraham was digging was just a symbol also for the well of salvation that God wanted to give us. And there's some people, they say, no, thank you. I don't want it. Stop it up. I'll go my own way. I'll drink from my own cisterns. I'll drink from my own wells, but not the wells of God. So we see here from this Isaiah chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, there are wells flowing. There was water flowing from the throne of grace. And it's good water. It's fresh, sweet, lots of minerals in it. Those waters are sound doctrine. Those waters are truth, if you want to put it that way. And the people of the land, they want their own waters. They bury the Sabbath under Sunday. So when they want to stop up the wells, what do they do? They take God's truth and they bury it. They hide the resurrection under the immortal soul and so forth. The majority of the world's religions are drinking uh, from the wells which Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Moses, and the apostles would not touch, wouldn't, would stay away from what they have. And why is that? Because their source is not founded on truth, but on tradition, dogma, ignorance, and error. And the bad part is, not only are they drinking from wells which Abraham never drank from, the people of the land try to stop up the wells that God provides. The wells of Abraham, the water of salvation. 
They want to stop it. Now we're picking up the story back in Genesis chapter 26, verses 16 through 21. And Abimelech said to Isaac, he was one of the leaders there in that land. He said, go away from us, for you're much mightier than we. And Isaac departed from there and pitched his tent in the valley of Gion and dwelt there. And Isaac dug again the wells of water, which they had dug in the days of Abraham his father, for the Philistine has stopped them up after the death of Abraham. So he's going back in that land. He knows where the wells are. So what are they doing? They're unstopping the wells. They're redigging them. They're taking out the debris, stones, sand. Who knows what they put in there? So what is he doing? He's, he's getting the wells ready to go. And, he, and what, not only did he dig those wells, it says if he called them by the names which his father had called them, also, Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found a well of running water there. But the herdsmen of Gear quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, The water is ours! So they called the name of the well Isk, because they quarreled with him. Then they dug another well, and they quarreled over that one also. So they called his name Chitna. It's interesting that they filled the, wall, the, the wells up that Abraham dug and weren't using them. Isaac comes in, he's digging, not only is he unplugging those wells, he's digging other wells, and the herdsmen of that area are contending with him for those wells when they had the other wells ready to go if they would just unplug them. We must move and find the wells of salvation, but where do we find that water of life? Where is it found? If you take your Bibles and go to Revelation chapter 7 and verse 17, last book of the Bible, and here's what John writes. It says here, For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of water. So where do you find them? Where the Lamb is. The Lamb will lead us to the water of life. The water from the throne of God. So Jesus is leading us to drink from the same waters that Abraham drank from, to have the same gospel. We are part of the same promises. We as the Gentiles are grafted into that stock. We are now joint heirs with Christ. And we're joint heirs with Christ as long as we are drinking God's water and eating his what? His truth in this book. Back in verse 18 of Genesis 26, and it says here, And Isaac dug again the wells of water, which he had dug in the days of Abraham his father. Isaac called the wells by the same name his father did. And I like this, and so I thought about it. Hmm. Isaac didn't change anything. Isaac didn't water down the water, if you want to put it that way. Isaac was trying to restore what Abraham found. So he called it by the same name, you know what? And what God gave Abraham, we have the same today. It's ours. God has given to us as a gift. In Isaiah chapter 58, verse 12, says, Those from among you shall build the old waste places. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations, and you shall be called the repair of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. So what do we see here? As we are looking now at Isaiah, he doesn't call it wells. He calls it old waste places, the places that we let run down, that have been neglected, truths that have been abandoned, abandoned for a long time. It says, you shall raise up the foundations of many generations, the truths of the former fathers, patriots and prophets, that we will rebuild those it says, you should be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. So God is calling us as a people to restore the truth that God gave us, to restore the everlasting gospel, to be proclaiming it, and uh, recovering it, and build it up, put it in place, make it functional, make it so it's working. And God will bless us as we do that. In verse 19 of Genesis 
chapter 26, it says, Isaac's servants did the digging. We are the servants today. Are we digging? Are we digging in those wells, taking out the, the tradition and error, freeing up the water to flow, to give life upon this planet? Are we putting in the time to find truth? Are we putting the time to share this truth? Digging, digging deeper. So God is asking us to be part of this great movement in the last days. He is restoring the truth. What the Revelation chapter 14 calls the everlasting gospel from every kindred nation, tongue, and people. The gospel, Jesus said, would be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. And then the end will come. That's our marching orders. God has given us a command to find the gospel, reclaim it, Take it back as ours and share it with the world. Isaiah chapter 61 verse 4. Here's what Isaiah chapter 61 verse 4 says. Talking about God's people. And they shall rebuild the old ruins. They shall raise up the former desolations. They shall repair the ruined cities. The desolations of many generations. So God is calling us to rebuild those old ruins that through the dark ages and even into our day lay ruined, abandoned. We are to what? Fix it. We are to put it back in place. And they shall raise up the former desolations. They shall repair those ruined cities. In Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 16, Jeremiah also picks up this thought. Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16 is Jeremiah's message. Thus says the Lord, stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. So I started out with the old wells as a metaphor, drinking from the uh, wells of salvation. Here, Isaiah, back in Isaiah, he talked about the rebuild the old ruins. Here, Jeremiah is using the old paths. And as for the old paths, where the good way is. So we, when we are building up the paths, that straight and narrow path that Jesus talked about, when we're putting it back in place, when we're restoring the truths, building a people, a nation of God's people in these last days. It says, and ask for the old paths, where the good way is, and what's he say? Walk in it. So once we're on the path, what do we do? We walk on that path, pressing towards the pearly gates. Then it says, here in verse 16, Jeremiah chapter 6, then you will find rest for your souls. So that's where that rest, when Jesus says, come unto me, all you who labor and heavy, and I will give you rest. When we come to him, it's on that path. We go through that straight gate, walk that narrow path. And that path is actually the path of rest. It's the path of peace. It's the path of salvation that God has given us. Are we on the path? If we've fallen off the path, get back on. If you haven't entered the path yet, then enter that door, that narrow door, and walk on that great path. And it's interesting, as Jeremiah was sharing this gospel message with the people in his day, this is just shortly before Babylon destroys uh, Jerusalem, and, he, and he's telling them, stand in the ways and see, in God's ways, ask for the old paths, where the good way is. You guys are out of the path. You are not in the good ways. You're in the bad ways. It's not working. It's going to bring you destruction. So go in the good way. Walk in it. And then you'll find rest for your souls. Then he says, but they said, we will not walk in it. So the people of his day says, no, you won't do it. Whenever Ham was in the land, filling the well, as soon as he died and left, what the people do? They filled his wells up. We don't have anything to do with it. So what about us? How are we doing? Are we doing any better? Are we walking in it? Are we saying, yes, Lord? Are we following him? Are we 
faithful and loyal. We appreciate everything he's done for us. And out of a, a sense of the love and power and salvation of God, we honor him by serving him, you know, walking in his ways, giving him glory. That's what God is looking for, people who will give him glory. So we see here, the heart of infinite love causes people back, back to the past, back, back to the wells of salvation. The world refuses to walk in those paths. They reject those paths. They reject those wells. They even will fight us. They fight people who have the gospel, who want to be in the old paths. What do we do if we want to be saved and follow God's original plan? That's a good question, because sometimes relatives will stop us. Sometimes our friends will make fun of us. The people at work will think we're weird. They peer pressure and things. Well, we may not want to do that. We may fear that, oh, if we follow God and we keep the Sabbath, well, we'll lose our jobs and we can't support our families. Well, you don't see the righteous begging bread. God will take care of you. God will follow you and watch out over you. So what do we do if we want to be saved and follow God's original plan? And then that's a good question. This is a question of eternal life or eternal death. Because the Bible teaches there was only one gospel. There was only one path that leads to life. There was only one well filled with the water from the throne of God. And Jesus says there's only one way. And he's it. And all these are metaphors talking about the same thing. If you want... The world, if, you, if the world wants to strive with us over the wells of salvation, what should be our response? Well, in the land, they were fighting with Isaac over the wells. There was, there was envy, jealousy. So, back, Genesis chapter 26, verse 22. Genesis chapter 26, and verse 22. And here's what the writer says, Moses. 22 through 26. So they're fighting over the wells. It says here, And he moved from there and dug another well, and they did not quarrel over it. So he called his name Rehoboth, because he said, For now the Lord has made room for us and we shall be fruitful in the land. And he went up from there to Beersheba, and the Lord appeared to him, the same light, and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for my servant Abraham's sake. So he built an altar there and called, the name, called on the name of the Lord, and he pitched his tent there, and there Isaac's servants dug a well, another well, everywhere they're going. They're looking for water. So, what did, he, what did uh, Isaac do when he was having contention with the people of the land? He just moved away. He just got out of that harmful situation. So there may be things that are holding us back. What is holding you back? What is keeping you from a full commitment? What's stopping you? Maybe you just need to leave the situation. Maybe you just need to find a little place to work, make some new friends, find a church that's teaching God's truth. So we should separate ourselves from the evils of the world so we can drink from those wells of salvation. Come out and be separate, says the Lord. So there's a calling out to come. When Jesus met Peter, James, John, Andrew, what did he do? He called them. Matthew sitting at the tax table. He called him. So he's calling us out to walk on his paths. So I'm thankful that he does that because it says the gospel is going to the whole world. So we're part of that. So the gospel is going to come to us and give us an opportunity to be faithful to Jesus and to walk in his ways, follow the ancient teachings. Nothing has changed from the days of Moses and Abraham. They all have the same gospel. She said, if you would believe Moses, then you would believe me. In Revelation chapter 22, in verse 17, the last invitation of mercy in the Bible, and we'll read it here.
And he says, And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Let him who hears say, Come. Let him who thirsts come. And whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. So, where it says, The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, it's actually, they keep on saying in the Greek. It doesn't stop. It's a constant appeal to the human race. Keep on, keep on coming. Come, come, you can make it. I love you. I care for you. You are mine. I want you in my kingdom. You are special to me. I want to forgive your sins. I want to rebuild your life. I want to make something out of you. I see something in you for my glory to increase my kingdom. So God is being merciful with this last call. You know, they keep on saying, come. Let him who hears say, come. Let him who thirsts. Are you thirsting for the waters of life? Are you thirsty to, to drink from the same spiritual waters that Abraham uh, drank? Are you thirsty for the same paths that Abraham walked? The same truths? Are you, are you just dying this and want to walk that way? Then it just says, whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Just come. Just come. So it's a continual invitation. Can you imagine a, a man's in love with a woman and Decides, I'm going to pop the question. I'm going to ask her. I'm going to. So he sets up a nice time where they can go out, maybe on a picnic or a quiet place. And they talk a little bit, and then he just says, You're the most wonderful thing in the world that ever happened to me. I want to just share my whole life with you. Will you marry me? And she wasn't really expecting it, or maybe she wasn't really sure. And she said, ah, I'm not so sure. Not so sure. Um, I need some time to think. And say he never asked the question again. Say after a week or so, he didn't say, hey, have you been thinking about this? Or, I want to live my life with you. I think you're special. And he was pursuing her in an appropriate way. Then she would think, hey, I'm worth fighting for. Wow. They're not giving up easy. Hmm, maybe this is genuine. And I want to say it's the same thing with God for you. He's not giving up easy. He's calling you to his ways. He's calling you to be faithful. I remember when my brother David, he's uh, six years younger than me, so I must have been, I was probably six when he was born, I was six, so I might have been eight when he started walking. And I remember him, you know, he'd get up and he would just kind of hold on to the couch and, and I was near the couch and then all of us, you know, we'd, we'd always tell him, come on, come on, come, come. And I remember who was there asking him to come, but I was in the room. And all of a sudden, he let go and he just walked across the room. I was like, wow, how cool is that? But it was the coaxing. It was, come on, you can do it. I want you. So what is God doing? He's coaxing you. Just, he's pursuing you. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. So there's a, a pursuing going on of the Godhead for us. This morning, God is inviting you to come, to come to his wells, to drink the same waters that Abraham drank, the waters that will quench the thirsting of your soul. Abraham drank from these waters. Isaac, Jacob, Moses, the prophets, Jesus, the apostles, God's last day people, all of us are going to be drinking from the same gospel. It's called the everlasting gospel. When we get to heaven, we'll be able to look every one of those men in the eye and say, I met the conditions like you did. I met those conditions. So we'll all hold our head up high, and we'll be talking to them and asking them about their lives, and they'll be saying, coming to us, tell us about the last days. You know, we knew it was going to come, but we just didn't know how it was going to happen. This week I was having a Bible study with some young people. And during the study, I told them that God was making it as easy as he could for them to be saved and as hard as he could for them to be lost. So I wasn't talking cheap grace. I'm just saying a fact. God is doing everything he can to remove every stumbling block so the path is clear and the waters are clear. And he's doing everything uh, to make it hard for us to be lost. But it's always our choice. We're just showing the goodness of God. Jesus 
the one who loves you is calling you to come. Come and drink from the waters of salvation. Will you answer his call? Maybe you've done it a long time ago. You haven't answered that call and made that recommitment. Now it's the time to do it. Get back on the path. Maybe you've never made that commitment. Now it's the time to get on the path. Jesus is coming soon. And if he does tarry a while, you, do, you may die before you make the commitment. There's a window of opportunity to give it to each one of us. So we don't want to squander it. We don't want to waste that window of opportunity for God wants to save us. Will you answer his call? And when you answer, the voice of the Holy Spirit will sweetly say, Come, you blessed of my Father. I love you. Take the waters of life freely. I will empower you. I will help you. I, the Godhead has pledged themselves to your success. They've, they've given all the resources and riches of heaven uh, for you to be in the kingdom. So drink those waters. Drink the waters of life that bring joy, peace, love, and salvation. When you say, come, don't hesitate. Come and drink to your heart's desire. For I will fill you to the fullness. I will fill you with overflowing. So let's have a word of prayer now. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for your goodness and kindness. Thank you that you have a gospel, that you have a path, that there are waters, spiritual waters, with, gal with wells that are dark, that we may drink freely from to our heart's desire. So bless each one watching. Help each of us to have faith, to be committed, because you are committed. We love you because you first loved us. And we are special to you and you want us in your kingdom. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.